Ephesians 2. Where in the past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Second Corinthians 11.14 And no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. You must know the difference. A reminder to all of us, the end times are here. Revelation 6.9 Revelation 6.9 Remember the breaking of the seals. And those very breaking of the seals we're living in today. We may be even in the last seal. The Bible tells us so. Can literally count the cars with that Transtar camera. You can see the lightning there. This is 45 the Gulf Freeway at 71st Street. This is headed in the eastbound direction. Okay, I thought for a second that was a, a lightning, flickering. but that is the street light that yeah. is flickering. So again, we talk about those power outages. Oh, 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 we're watching. We're watching. Is this, I'm assuming that's probably a transformer? I thought right it might there? be that about the blow. No, up. this is a transformer. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, okay. I mean, you're watching it right here through our Transtar camera live. It is 3.39 as we are.
It's even crazier up close, you guys. Like, <laughs> that's the light pole. This is street level, and there's Allen Parkway. Like, you, it's, yeah. Had anything to do with this fire sparking. Now, here's a live look at the scene right now. You can see the smoke coming up from the, that tree, those trees over there. Our photojournalist Steve Garcia is right near where the fire is. He was evacuated from the Placer Vare Airport earlier. Steve, what can you tell us about this fire right now? Yeah, Brady, um, I was I, maybe I got to Steve uh, spoke with a woman just moments ago about um, her having a plane currently at the airport. Take a listen to what she had to say. They told us we could not move the plane. He couldn't even move it down the runway. We just have to sit here and hope it doesn't burn. He, at one point, they were flying so low, he got a uh, fire retardant on the plane and he had to duck under the wing. So they're, I mean, they're working hard. And of course, we will continue to track this fire as it develops. But in the meantime, here's a map of the zones that are being evacuated at this point. Now, the red zones are mandatory evacuations, and those ones in the yellow are just warnings at this point. And these zones have been expanding by the minute. So to stay up to, to date on all of these maps, you can find the strongest them on our temperatures website. right now. I mean, you can just see how red it is on the map. Now, that's a heat signature of what we're feeling right now from that fire. The darker the red color is actually the hot hottest those temperatures are, and of course, it's right by the airport.
Avenue bridge between Harlem and the Bronx is shut down in traffic because of the sheer heat. The F for about an hour now just to cool it down. Wow, that's something you don't mm -hmm. hear about too often. Let's go to Dan Rice overhead of Sky Fox with the latest. Dan, what are we looking at? And Stephen and Tasha, this is the bridge itself. It's called a swing drawbridge. What they do is when traffic on the river wants to come onto this bridge, they'll swing the center portion of that bridge to be perpendicular uh, with the roadway there to allow marine traffic to come through. When they tried to put this bridge back into its closed position to allow traffic to go over, they were unable to line the bridge back up with its base. And you can see the NYC uh, DOT, they're down there doing their best, trying to figure out how to get this bridge to realign with the road deck again. As you talked about, the the NY. They were over here. They're still down the river. They've been pouring water onto the bridge because of the heat. Most of the metal on this 126-year-old structure is swollen from the heat. So because of that, it's unable to line up with the locking mechanism that allows traffic to go across this bridge. So as a result, they've been spending the better part of two hours now trying to cool down the bridge so they can realign it back with the road deck that it connects to, the, uh, to both uh, Harlem and the Bronx. Come back into the Bronx for one second, which you're going to see. Uh, it's just about every roadway in the South Bronx 
much jammed up with traffic. Of course, this is a free bridge. No one wants to use the toll-laden uh, Triborough Bridge, so they're all trying to make their way over to the other free bridges, the Madison Avenue Bridge. That's where a lot of the traffic is trying to get to, and until that happens, uh, or until they get this bridge back into place, you're going to see a lot of traffic uh, traffic st uh, stacking up there in yeah, the Bronx, wow. Natasha. It's just wow. that hot. It's wild oh sight. It doesn't look like it's that close to being in the right position, too. No. It's a lot wow. of feet off, it looks like. They've right, been trying well. for the last half hour to put this back into place. This is that same thing that happens at Wharton State Forest in Burlington County. The New Jersey Forest Fire Service has confirmed that fireworks were the cause of that place. The fire is now 75% contained after flames first sparked last Friday. Officials say it's already scorched over 4,000 acres. Action News reporter Sharifa Jackson joining us now live as crews continue working against these uh, unbearable hot conditions to try to beat back this fire. Sharifa. Yeah, Brian, Sarah, still a lot of grueling work ahead for these firefighters, and it's something they say could have been 100% prevented. It didn't take investigators long to determine the cause was from fireworks. It's something that's illegal at state parks. A view from above shows this thick smoke over Wharton State Forest. On the ground, crews continue to work to contain what's being called the Tea Time Hill wildfire. In a matter of four days, this wildfire has consumed 4,000 acres. For the fire on the interior is continuing to consume unburned ground, and that's probably going to continue up until the time we get some substantial rain. Fire crews say the wildfire began in a remote area July 4th, ignited from a fireworks device. It wasn't until 9 a.m. the next morning the flames were spotted. By that time, able to spread to more than 400 acres. Yeah, the smoke has been really thick. You can smell it like miles away. Molly Ehrlich has been watching from afar. It's really unfortunate that fireworks ended up causing this problem, and it affects so many people and a lot of my friends. Around 75 firefighters are working around the clock. The job intensified by the excessive heat. Chief Bill Donnelly is sending this warning. Asking people to be careful. Um, Take you know, a look, it's engulfed thousands of acres in South Jersey. Now, the Forest Fire Service says the fireworks were lit in Wharton State Forest on the 4th of July, and the blaze wasn't spotted until the morning after, near a campground, which was later evacuated. As of yesterday, that wildfire scorched an estimated 4,000 acres. At last report, it was 75% contained. Officials ask anyone with information to call the State Park Police tip line. Just how hot is it? The Third Avenue Bridge is stuck in the open position, all because of overheating machinery. Newscopter 7 is over the bridge. FDNY Marine units are trying to cool down the equipment and close the bridge there. Now that's hot. Mm -hmm. We have several reports tonight. I would just well, the time is at 630. Did you feel it this morning? We had a minor earthquake just to the east-northeast of around the CD Lake area. It was uh, rated as a 4.2 initially, but after the review has been down graded to around a 3.9. That's still considered a minor earthquake and a number of you sharing comments that it felt you. Artie James said, said he woke up uh, this morning, thinks his body sensed, sensed the earthquake. He didn't really feel it, but it was felt in Ferndale, also in Polson and in Pinnacle at around 5 a.m. Felt a little minor shake. Now, it wasn't rated as a 3.9, which is considered a minor earthquake. And uh, when we do have those 3.9 uh, earthquakes, there is a little bit of, of a ground shaking, but there's not much damage. Once we start to get uh, into that maybe moderate range, that five to six magnitude earthquake, that's when we do get a little bit of damage. But regardless, we had a minor earthquake this morning. If you want to join the conversation, head over to our Facebook page and let us know uh, what it felt like in your neighborhood. Now, throughout the day today, temperatures are going to feel comfortable, breezy this afternoon, but then hot and dry with weather alert days next week. Everything you need to know is coming up in about 10 minutes. Good morning, Karen. It is still overcast here in Port O'Connor, but as you mentioned, the rain bands starting to move to the east, and so thankfully the rain and now the wind here have stopped. You were talking about the dangers of flooding and heavy rain, and that's what this flooding you see behind me is from. Uh, residents telling us this is all just from the rain that fell here in Port O'Connor overnight, and this is one of the areas that was forecast or warned to see some storm surge from barrel in the overnight hours of four to seven feet of storm surge, but that never really materialized. If you look all the way up and down the street, you'll see that the pavement kind of reemerges here just a, you know, 50 yards or so from where we are. And the good news is, is that this minor localized flooding is just about as bad as it got. Now, this is a community both here in Port O'Connor, Port Lavaca, where we rode out the storm in the overnight hours, that this was right in the center of one of the earlier forecast tracks. So a lot of people here did board up. A lot of people decided to evacuate 
and move out. But thankfully for the folks here, the storm moved a little bit further to the east. There are still some people here this morning, Karen, who are without power, but power crews are moving very quickly. As we drove into the area this morning, we did not see what we often do with storms like this, which is power lines down and lines snapped and tree debris all over the place. There is some of that and there will be some cleanup. But thankfully, folks here that are on the east side or I'm sorry, the west side of Lavaca Bay and going all the way down to Corpus Christi and further down to Brownsville, they were able, Karen, to escape the worst of this hurricane. All right, and that is certainly good news for them. All right, Jason, of course, thank you very and 5 much. And 5% containment evacuation orders and warnings remain in effect. We visited the overnight shelter at Union Mine High School. Red Cross volunteers told us five people spent the night there, many waiting to learn when they'll finally be able to return home. Firefighters say it's not yet known since conditions can change. Roughly 180 PG&E customers in that area have been without power since yesterday. And firefighters are going from one fire to another as they deal with extreme heat and changing conditions on the front lines throughout California. And officials hope that people are careful about what they're doing when they're outdoors. ABC 10's Garish Paul Sanga reports. The extreme heat and fire dangers continue across Northern California. The unprecedented heat helping dry out vegetation, making them vulnerable to ignite. It just takes something as small as just a little spark. That is what happened Sunday afternoon as Sacramento fire crews quickly stopped this fast-moving vegetation fire behind the North Natomas Aquatics Complex. This started at about a one and a half acre grass fire, quickly spread to five and grew from there, ending at 17, but this had the potential for a hundred acres. Just a few months ago, this entire field was covered with dry grass as tall as this, but they brought in goats that were able to eliminate this entire fuel bed in this area which helped this fire not move as fast. And if you have that very tall vegetation, you get a much hotter fire that can spot. And then we also have, we're right around a neighborhood. Captain Justin Sylvia says no injuries were reported, no homes damaged, and how the fire started is under investigation. This could have been much worse. 40 miles east in Placerville, the activity on the pay fire is relatively calmer compared to Saturday's heavy attack. This new video from Cal Fire shows a dozer removing vegetation and creating a barrier in the middle of the fight, hoping to stop the fire from spreading. Most of the areas around the fire are warnings, and the areas interior to the burn are only those that are still on orders. Battalion Chief Chris Vestal says crews will be on the fire for several more days, knocking out every hot spots as they deal with the extreme heat and changing conditions. Some of the firefighters that came here were recently released from the Thompson fire, and this is now their third different fire on a single deployment. They're already pre-tired from Story five, hurricane to a fires. tropical storm. Barrel has caused heavy damage from the Caribbean all the way to Texas. Tonight, West Memphis emergency officials tell our Shea Simon now Arkansas is bracing for what is next. High winds and heavy rain hit Texas Monday as tropical storm barrel pushes inland. Tonight, Arkansas gearing up for what is to come. It looks like the path is in a northeastern trajectory, so, you know, we're going to experience, you know, that hit that rainfall, you know, and uh, the National Weather Service indicates that we could see some isolated tornadoes. As Emergency Management Director Dwayne Rose says West Memphis is ready for the remnants of barrel's rampage. We always uh, make sure that all of our um, emergency services personnel are up to speed and know what's going on and stay, you know, up to date on the current weather conditions. So we we are prepared just like we are prepared every day. While officials are ready, Rose says it's also important for residents to be ready. Things like filling your car's gas tank, charging your phone in case of a power outage, and enabling emergency notifications is key. Text West Memphis to 91896. And that's 91896, text West Memphis, and it will allow you to opt in to our Text My Gov system. And we, uh, that's an, uh, a communications tool that we can use to just keep our residents up to date. Through parts of Mexico and the Caribbean, Barrel has already cut a deadly path, leaving millions in Texas without power. So we do need to be mindful and, and be aware and uh, not let our guard totally all the way down. In Memphis, Shay Simon, WREG News Channel 3. Destructive wildfire.
fires now, in California. Santa Barbara County firefighters are struggling to contain the Lake Fire. Take a look. It's one of more than 150 fires that broke out across the state over the holiday weekend amid hot and dry conditions, causing statewide evacuations as the fast-moving flames tear through dry vegetation toward homes and communities. Let's bring in ABC News Live anchor Kana Whitworth. Kana, you've been following this all weekend long. I've been watching all of your coverage. What is the latest on the evacuations and really what are residents telling you right now? Look, Maria, residents here are very concerned. This is a tight knit community. We're talking about a ranching community here. People have livestock and horses. It's also a winemaking community, right? So there's a tremendous concern among residents here, but they also say firefighters are doing a fantastic job. I spoke with emergency services. There are evacuation orders and warnings that are currently in effect, and they say they could expand based on the fire behavior. And what firefighters have done, though, Maria, is they've kept this fire in the wilderness. So you can sort of see that plume there behind me. But what they told me this morning is their concern is, is when that fires in those higher elevations, we're talking about 2,500 feet or so, the temperatures there are hotter and it's drier as well. So even if they get some humidity down here in the low lying areas, it's an entirely different situation up there. And so they're worried about these sundowner winds that might come in tonight and push this fire over those containment lines and towards these communities. And Maria, this fire has already exploded to more than 20,000 acres so far. You know, Kena, I just heard you talk a little bit about what firefighters are having to deal with right now. Give me some of the extremes and the challenges they are dealing with. And more than anything, what are officials telling residents about when they might be able to go home or, or check out their properties? Right, so this is an area where people are used to this kind of thing, right? You're seeing that a lot of people have created defensive space around their properties in case a fire does come. The good news, Maria, is that at this point, they have this fire about 8% contained. Any kind of containment is good news. However, they are worried about what's going on up in those hills. So they're relying heavily right now on hand crews. They're actually dropping hot shots into the fire. I'm told they're creating landing pads up there for helicopters so that they can move those crews. Clearly, the air attack is crucial on this fire. Well, a they woman in Douglas County is in a little bit of a tricky situation. Her social security number says she's dead, but let me tell you, she is very much alive. Olivia is your reporter in Douglas County. And Olivia, this woman reached out to you with her very bizarre story. Yeah, she did, Kelly. And grieving a loved one and managing their estate is a hard enough process. But for this woman, reporting her mother dead led to her own life mistakenly being ended on paper. And she's still dealing with the fallout today. When Judy Olson lost her mom in February of 2021. This is probably relevant. She put aside grieving to follow instructions left in a toes up file. Here are all the things you need to do when I die. First on the list, notifying the Social Security Administration of her mother's death. The person on the phone asked for both Judy and her mother's Social Security numbers. I said, why do you need my information? Just to verify who you are and that you're related. Next, Judy went to the bank to liquidate her mother's trust, where the manager broke some shocking news. So we know who you are, but when we pulled up your account, you are considered deceased. Still very much alive, Judy was locked out of her accounts. Why did that happen? How did it happen? She brought her identification to the Social Security office to arrange her resurrection. It's clear you are you and we'll get it taken care of. Judy thought the ordeal was behind her, save for the occasional joke. And somebody would pipe up, well, at least you're not dead like Judy. Until she filed her mother's 2021 taxes in 2022 and never received the return. Yes, you you were marked deceased. You are not anymore. So, you know, we can get going on everything. But despite calling and visiting the office multiple times, she still hasn't received the nearly four thousand dollars. Since the floodwaters have lowered, communities are left cleaning up the damage. I'm Greta Gady, your Sarpy County neighborhood reporter. This campground in Bellevue has been forced to close due to flood damage, and the cleanup process has just started. The Windsor Cove campground located in Hayworth Park had to shut down during the flood and has still yet to reopen. The owners of the campground went to work on repairs right when the floodwaters went down, and they have been working on the cleanup since. As soon as the water started receding, um, I believe it was last Monday, um, Roger was in here and then I followed in on Tuesday and we've been out here every day ever since, sun up, sun down, trying to get cleanups. The grounds need several repairs and all the electrical has to be replaced before campers can return. Another issue, 
Some parts of the campground can't be reached to get repaired because the ground is still too soft for the equipment. The owners have lost thousands due to the shutdown and still don't know how things are going to go moving forward. Financially, it hit us pretty good. We've had to cancel several thousands of dollars of reservations for this month. Um, and depending on what next week and entails, then we'll have to. So here at Furnace Creek, uh, there is an official weather station that's managed by the National Weather Service um, out of Las Vegas. Uh, you know, that is the official thermometer. So when we talk about official heat records, um, that's what we're looking at. The thermometer outside, it's indirect sunlight, it's pretty close to the building, so it's getting more radiant heat. So it does tend to be about one to five degrees warmer, uh, particularly during the summer, during these hottest days, um, it will run a little bit hotter than the official weather station. Uh, you know, Death Valley, it is a dry heat, but that dry heat is pretty intense. Um, so when you step out of your vehicle, it's like stepping your entire body out into an oven. Um, it's just baking. Honestly, it's definitely shocking. I don't know how anything can survive out here. You can definitely feel the heat on your skin. Um, and I can see how it's probably the hottest, highest heat record out here. It's worse than an oven. I don't know. Yeah, it's like an oven. It's like yeah, walking like in the oven. Or, or you open the oven after 350. Yeah. It's in the face. Hot. <laughs> It's hot. It's it's like an overwhelming ex moment. You feel like you are lost in time, and you just go back in the in time. You, you detach from the present reality and being part of it, and how brutal it had to be, <laughs> and how fortunate we are that we have the luxury of air conditioning and cars and. But it's fascinating. With temperatures rising into the 90s, extreme heat can pose all sorts of challenges for people experiencing homelessness. I'm your downtown Boise neighborhood reporter Riley Shoemaker visiting Boise's designated cooling center at Corpus Christi. It was hard, really hard. Alan Miller has been experiencing homelessness for nearly eight years, which in summer months comes with its own challenges. It gets hot and I get hot. I don't like, I don't like, I don't like the heat. They're living um, in different encampments. They're on the streets, they're in cars, they're by the river, and that's who we're really trying to save. This year, Corpus Christi House in downtown Boise is the designated cooling center to help people escape the sun and heat, offering air condition and shade, food and water, and community. Hey, Alan. For people like 19-year-old Nico Hancock. You can donate, like, clothes. Hi, I'm back. I am so glad to see you, sweetheart. Who has been in and out of shelters for nine months. It's a beautiful community. People take care of each other. People protect each other. Having a cool place for them to be and to keep them hydrated. Uh, heat stroke becomes an issue. A lot of our guests are medically fragile, and that triggers a lot of medical emergencies for us. And local organizations are asking for donations. I get excited over anything, even a pair of socks. And with temperatures climbing. And now an extreme heat warning. Temperatures are expected to soar to 115 degrees today as Bakersfield continues to go through an excessive heat warning. 17's Justin White interviewed some of our most vulnerable in the heat and joins us with more details. Justin. Rob, many of us in Bakersfield are suffering in the extreme heat, but for the homeless population of Kern County, every day is a fight for survival. Another heat wave decimates the city of Bakersfield, almost every day climbing ever closer to that 118 degree record set more than a century ago. Today, a high of 115. It's and it's hot. John Duvall has been homeless for eight years. He also says the heat is becoming unbearable for both him, his friend who goes by Bird, and their dog, Buddy. He's only able to get water from the Starbucks just off Mount Vernon. I can't go into none of them stores up there only because I'm homeless. Drew Molina asked for money and food on Mount Vernon in Columbus. He holds a positive attitude about the situation, especially when it comes to living outside in the extreme heat. I just try to get by, drink a lot of water. <laughs> It's it. Drink a lot of water. The cooling centers in Bakersfield can provide relief for those who choose to go, but Molina says going can be a hassle. So it's more easier out here 
than going through all that, you know, you I just get by on where I'm at, that's it. For others, it's an issue of finding the cooling centers, like for Robert Hobbs. How do you know where cooling centers are around here? He says getting into homeless shelters have also been hit and miss. He moves from spot to spot, panhandling to get what he needs. People give me, you know, step...